All righty, welcome back for another episode of Two Plain Sports. Today, we've got a good show for you. We're going to talk a, a little bit of recruiting. Um, Oklahoma's picking up a few crystal balls. They ended up losing out on a, an in-state talent that they didn't actually offer, but felt like Oklahoma had a shot or a potential chance of offering. And then we're going to talk about, is Oklahoma going to suck next year? I mean, according to Vegas, they're supposed to. Um, we're going to be talking the win total. Are they crazy? Is it realistic or what our expectations are with that? So, but before we do, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel. We're on our way to 6,300 subscribers. So be one of the, uh, what is it? 90 something that gets us to 6,300. Hit the subscribe button, turn the notification bell on, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Apple, Spotify, and TikTok. Everything's linked in the description below and be sure to um, just like the video and subscribe but okay so yeah help us out and um oklahoma's playing basketball as we're recording this right now so um we're not going to really talk too much about oklahoma basketball but i do want to mention um before we even start off the top oklahoma went two and a hole last week they took care of business unfortunately you know sometimes it's painful to watch but at the end of the day a win is a win is a win is a win and it does not matter um oklahoma took took care of uh, Oklahoma State and Bedlam. Uh, Brandon and I will be attending attending Bedlam uh, here in a couple of weeks in Stillwater for the final farewell tour. Um, I'll be at the Kansas game next Saturday as well. Or I guess, oh, are you? Yeah. Okay. I didn't realize you were going down for that game. That, that'll that be a good one. Yeah. Um, but I'll just point out real quick that Oklahoma beat Oklahoma State in spite of some Really questionable officiating decisions, I think, that were made in that game. I, I've never in my life seen a team, you know, every now and again you see a team score like a dunk or something like OU did and get excited and they get teed up for it. Uh, the refs hit, hit OU with three tees after scoring um, in that Bedlam game, which I've never seen before in my life seen. Um, I feel like that shouldn't be allowed. That, 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 was, the, uh, that was garbage. And at one point, the free throw disparity was like 23 to 7 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it, it was ridiculous. It was real bad officiating um, yeah. on Toby night, too. So, yeah. But despite all that, Oklahoma took care of business. Uh, as we're recording this, they are down right now. So, um, hopefully, they can pull a rabbit out of their hat and get a win on the road at Baylor. But we'll have to see. All right. So, probably for the reason why most people are here, let's start talking about Oklahoma football um OU picked up a crystal ball um for 2025 three-star safety uh Marcus Wilberly from Arkansas I'm not even going to try to say the city that he's from unless you guys can I I can't even well I might as well try I I always butcher this um Bowett I think it's Bowett uh, Arkansas is my my pronunciation but I also butcher everything so you can, you know, correct Bullet. us, but I don't, I don't know. B a u x i t e. Yeah, Bowett, Arkansas. Um, Steve Wiltfong is entering in Crystal Ball for him. Danny West. Um, so he's gotten a handful. He's got four um, of the five that are currently Crystal Ball, and they all came in within the last day or two. Um, and whenever you saw Steve Wiltfong, and then Danny West is from Hog Sports, basically from Arkansas. Um, Arkansas insiders, you got to feel like Oklahoma's making a move here. Oklahoma just recently offered, picked up a crystal ball, and all signs are kind of pointing towards. It seems like this is a kid that's going to commit. Jose, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with the where the signs are pointing. This guy seems to be like this for this year's version of Jaron Canick. Um, Jaron got a lot of hype coming into OU because of when he came into OU. Not that he wasn't a really good football player in high school or that he isn't becoming a good football player now, um, but he's still pretty raw. I think we're we're all seeing it now with his how his progression has been. It's clearly much slower than a lot of us anticipated when he did come in. Him coming in being that guy that was set on playing for Brent Venables, I think got the fan base behind him initially so this kid marcus might not get that same treatment but they're very similar players to me uh, play all over the football field for their high school marcus mainly plays safety but if you watch his huddle 
He's played quarterback, running back, receiver, linebacker. Didn't see too much of him on the defensive line, but if you have a guy, but he comes up and plays run support a ton. Um, so he's a guy that you can kind of see anywhere on the field. Oklahoma is recruiting him as a safety. So this is Brandon Hall's territory. Guy that's doing an amazing job for Oklahoma on the recruiting trail. Has been since he got here and keeping uh, Robert Spears Jennings in that class in 2022, in 2023 securing uh, Peyton Bowen. 2024, you can say was a down year if you look at, you know, the just the rankings, but you still got a very good safety in Jaden Hardy. In 2025, you're looking at Marcus and, you know, potentially a Jonah Williams, who we talked about in our last video, who's also picking up a ton of crystal balls for Oklahoma. So Brandon Hall is doing an amazing job when it comes to recruiting. At this point, I think people are going to look at this kid's rating and say he's not what Oklahoma wants or needs or they're going to you know, create their own narrative. But this kid is very talented. He might not play the moment he steps uh, in Norman, but he could be an impact player later on. Yeah, no, for sure. He's, I think Jaron Canning said this is a really, really good player comparison just because of the way he plays all over the field. Um, yeah, he's, I mean, he's, he's very athletic, man. That, that's, it's pretty fun. Uh, it's kind of cool when you, when you got a guy playing, um, literally ever a quarterback running back defense i imagine he had a pretty good time in high school doing all that uh, the, it's moving really really quickly uh with 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 marcus Wimberly here because i mean i feel like he was on campus a week or two ago we talked about it briefly he was offered um on the 12th of february and now all these stuff's coming in it feels like it's going to be a deal that gets done pretty quickly i wouldn't be shocked if you saw it sometime over the weekend or something with his commitment he's Picking up some offers late, uh, so we, I don't think he's really that true three-star, but you, you're right. People will start making those uh, narratives of their own, uh, three-star you, all that. But, you know, he's getting some big-time offers. Ole Miss offered recently, Michigan offered. Um, he's He was offered by Arkansas, once committed to Arkansas, decommitted. So he's a player going a little bit under the radar. He can do a lot of different things for Oklahoma. I think you know if, if he does commit to Oklahoma, like a lot of these type, like a lot of these type of kids, he's gonna have to make his make his bread in a uh, special teams at first. And I think he's very capable of doing so. And, you know, talking about his visits and what his commitment timeline is, I mean, yes, he came, came off a visit, what, a week or two ago, I think two weeks ago, I can't remember, but either way he was there and then he picks up an offer and gets a crystal ball. He, you know, he had a great visit. He's got some other visits scheduled. He's going to SMU, I think in early March, then he's going to Memphis and then he's even going to Alabama and then he's going back to OU April 9th. So he's kind of got his visits already planned out. And to be honest, I kind of see him continuing not committing like tomorrow or anything like that. But I see that April visit being the one where Oklahoma seals the deal um, and kind of shuts the door on everyone else. Uh, Michigan's looming, but I think the, the turbulence with the coaching staff and also, I mean, the sanctions and what punishment <laughs> the university could end up receiving – I would think is playing into the the decision as well. So that'd be my guess. I'm thinking I'm thinking April uh, will be maybe his timeline for for a commitment. But and as he could be as... the first. He could be the first domino to fall. You know, we always see that first guy commit, and it seems like there's a little bit of a wave after the first summer commitment. Could be him, like right after uh, Memorial Day, get get his commitment done, and then you see hopefully you know a a nice little wave of, of guys committing before July when Oklahoma seems to do the most of their damage on the recruiting trail. July is a good month, and July sometimes extends into into August, and it just becomes July part two. So, anyway, Oklahoma seems to be positioning themselves well here. Uh, Brandon Hall's recruiting at a, at a high level, and this is another guy that – I know it's a three star, but, you know, he is obviously being identified and offered by schools like Ole Miss, Michigan, Tennessee. And then he's going to visit Alabama. Could Kalen DeBoer and their staff offer him as well? So he's obviously talented. Um, so moving on, we're going to switch switch sides of the ball. Uh, 2025 four star running back Tory Blaylock. Uh, has recently picked up a crystal ball in favor of Oklahoma. Uh, Colin Kennedy, OU's insider, um, has crystal balled him to OU. It seems like Oklahoma, um, Troy Blaylock is a guy that they are focusing in on as far as uh, for the running back position in 
in this 2025 class. Um, I'll just mention it quickly. I know we talked about Caden Knighton. Um, Brandon, I don't know if you were on the episode, but I know Jose was on when we were talking about Caden Knighton, where he decommitted to Vanderbilt and announced his visit to OU pretty darn simultaneously. And it seemed like, oh, man, Oklahoma could be offering Caden Knighton this weekend on his visit. That ultimately did not occur, uh, at least publicly. No no offer was posted. Caden Knighton from Winniewood, Oklahoma, committed to Baylor. And so he's he's gone and he's off the board. Uh, granted, he's decommitted once, so if Oklahoma maybe pressed him, maybe Oklahoma could sway him. But Tory Blaylock, that means he becomes – more that much more important and he's talented in his own right uh but brandon what do you think yeah we just talked about marcus wimberley and his athleticism and i mean he's a very athletic kid playing all over the field but you look at tory blaylock just his bloodlines i mean his brother's at wisconsin his dad played at uh, sam houston or something uh you know it's it's a, it's a very athletic family and him himself is uh you know a pretty fun running back to look at too he averaged you know, seven yards of carry, uh, multiple touchdowns, also a good pass catching back, 14 yards of reception last season. So very much a dual threat type running back. He does have the, that Alabama stamp of approval. Uh, this is like the last year I can use it. We've talked about, but, you know, Nick Saban did offer. Uh, so, I'm, I mean, I, I always believe in that. I, I think that there's there's a lot to like about Tory Blaylock. I agree. And it just, like Brum said, it basically makes it seem like Oklahoma has zeroed in on Tory. And I don't think that is the case, but when you're looking at it from the outside, <clears throat> you don't have too many running backs left on the board here for Oklahoma. Um, there's, I can't remember the, the, the guy's name, but he was supposed to visit in the early, the first junior day event. He ended up going to Oklahoma State, if I remember correctly. I wish I could remember him, but he was also a four-star running back. Um, you know, he he has made the decision. I think he is expected. If I I wish I could remember this kid's name because I remember reading that he is expected to show up to Oklahoma at some point this spring. But given that Tory was actually there on his junior day visit, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of crystal balls come in for him. Things seem to be going in the right direction here. His his dad, I think his parents, or at least his dad was there on the visit with him for junior day, was very um, active on social media, especially Twitter, when talking about Oklahoma and you know the experience he had there, you know, posting a ton of pictures of Tory and, and himself on the visit. So seems like you know they've won over dad. They won. They're working on winning over Tory. You got to like your hopes and assuming that, you know, the expectation I think right now is that this class is going to be smaller than the last two. Um, you know, we've been in the mid to high 20s over the last two classes. It's probably going to be closer to to that 20 number overall, maybe like 22. And with the depth that you have at the running back position, you might only have one spot available unless you find a second guy that you feel like is absolutely necessary to add to the room. Or something happens where a kid enters the transfer portal that was unexpected, which can always happen, especially at, after the spring game. You know, at this point, it seems like it's Tory um, or bust when it comes to that running back position for Oklahoma in the 2025 class. And at the end of the day, I still believe that Caden Knighton, if Oklahoma really pressed him and really needed him. I mean, he received his Baylor offer and committed the same day or the day after. And so I still think he could be influenced if Oklahoma needed to. I think it kind of shows maybe the confidence that Oklahoma has in keeping those in-state kids. Because we've talked about it the last two cycles. OU's been, for the most part, with in-state, especially not as highly touted. They don't really start going all out until the spring. So they can give those preferred walk-on spots with NIL to support them and hopefully paying for the entire tuition, if not most of it. Um, So maybe they were just super confident that, hey, we can get you enough NIL opportunities that it's offsetting your cost and you're still making money. I mean, that's that's a bold strategy, especially for a talented running back um, that is getting plenty of scholarship offers to other power five programs so maybe that they're just 
the NIL story isn't what people make it out to be. Um, that Oklahoma's broke. They're just spending their money differently than other schools. No, they are. Um, they're they obviously take care of all their players on the on the roster and not just the top 20, 25 guys. All right. Let's move on to another fun segment. And I feel like uh, this one will cause a spirited debate, especially in the comment section. Las Vegas or FanDuel, um, at least we're referencing FanDuel, had Oklahoma's win total open up at six and a half. The over under was six and a half uh, for the 2020 four season um jose i think it's 2024 season um but just and and so oklahoma is according to FanDuel, opened up as a four and a half or six and a half was the line it is now shifted up to seven and a half because the public must have been loading up on some money um over six and a half brandon i'll start with you thoughts I mean, I'm going to hammer the over, obviously. I mean, this year, you know, the, for the, or the season we just had, I think we all predicted nine and three at worst. Um, and we obviously hit on that. We went 10 and two. And that's a game or that's a team that should have won, you know, at least 11 games. Um, honestly, they probably could have won out. They, they lost some games. Both losses, really, re- realistically, they shouldn't have lost. But, you know, that that is what it is. This year, I mean, I think you're going to take some lumps, no doubt. You're, you're playing a – uh, not a true freshman, but he's a guy that's in Jackson Arnold that's incredibly talented, but he's going to make some of those freshman mistakes being year one as a, you know, true blue starter the whole way through. And the schedule is um, at times daunting. You know, you look at, at LSU, Alabama is always Alabama. You're going on the road at Missouri at Oxford to play Ole Miss um, at Auburn. You know, there, there, there are some tough games, but to set at six and a half, I think is, I mean, I think this team is an eight win team at worst. Um, I'm kind of looking at eight and four, nine and three. At that range is what I is what I personally believe. And you, you know, if you look at the schedule, you open at Temple, that's a win. Houston, I think you win that one. You Tulane, you beat them. Tennessee, I think you win. At Auburn, I think you win. So I think off the bat, you, you probably start five and zero. Texas is is uh, that's a tough team, um, but it, it is OU Texas. I feel like anything can happen in that game. Who knows? South Carolina is not very good. Maine's not very good. Uh, you know, those those are seven to eight wins right there uh, if, if you count beating Texas. And even if you lose to Texas, I don't think you lose out uh, against Auburn, LSU, well, uh, Ole Miss, Missouri. I, I mean, I, I don't think you go 0-4 in those four games. I think you pick up, you know, at least one, uh, probably two of them. I, I think they set it really low, and to me it feels like free money to hit the over. Yeah, there it is. Uh, here's the thing. I agree just from a very biased and emotional standpoint, because when you look, you're looking at the schedule, those first three meet, those first three games, you know, just from what you have returning on the defensive side of the ball, the talent that we all expect Jackson Arnold to have on the football field as a full-time starter, like you mentioned, that's three wins, right? Or at least that's the expectation. It doesn't really start to get daunting, maybe until Tennessee and even still. You don't know what Tennessee has. That's a team that could be facing sanctions because of the NIL stuff that um, was reported earlier in the offseason. At Auburn, that's a tough game because it's on the road. Your first true road game as an SEC team in an SEC environment. Probably one of the hardest ones because even Alabama struggles there. That is their rival, but... They play them regularly enough where you think they kind of figure it out and really know how to coach the kids into staying even keel, but they don't. It always seems to bite them in the ass or get them close enough to danger. I mean, we almost saw them lose this year if it wasn't for a miraculous play at the end of the game. I think Texas is one where Texas did something last year that they haven't done in a long time. They've kind of re-upped that that, that opportunity for them to be overhyped year in and year out. Because people like to look at what Oklahoma's lost. And as we're seeing here in Vegas, they're seeing that what OU's lost. They lost their starting quarterback. They you know, that they, they lost some, you know, guys on the offensive line, the entire offensive line. And they've lost some other pieces throughout. But you're returning every starter. Um, 
or like eight of the nine or eight of the 11 starters on the defensive side of the ball, um, which is the part, which is where Oklahoma has struggled. If you don't really think of Oklahoma and think they're going to struggle offensively. Now we do have two new coordinators, so I'm sure that's something that's being taken into account for, but there's other teams that have lost coaches, players, big time players too. I mean, Alabama lost Dallas Turner. They have Keon Keeley that who they hope is going to be there, but is Alabama going to be the same Alabama without Nick Saban? I don't think anyone expects that um, outside of Alabama fans, but we'll see what Kalen DeBoer can do. I think if anything, you look at the road games and Missouri is probably the toughest one when you just compare teams. Like if it was neutral site, I think Missouri is the hardest team that we're going to play um, or the toughest team to play this year. Ole Miss is going to be tough, but they somehow like to underperform as well. Missouri, Missouri to me seems like the toughest game. Just when you stack team versus team on paper, they're just, they, 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 they performed well last year. and The teams they lost to were the teams they were supposed to lose to, but Oklahoma, on the other hand, like like Brum mentioned and, and like you mentioned, Brandon, oh, you lost teams they probably shouldn't have lost to last year. So got to, you know, hopefully they figure those things out. I agree that the over is there, but somehow Vegas always knows something. Like last year, the win total for Colorado was three and a half. I mean, I know Colorado got annoying after some time, but they started the year off. 3 and 0, right? Or 3 and 1 or something like that, and it seemed like they were going to cover 3 and a half easily. They got one more win and somehow just got ran for the rest of the season. So hopefully Vegas is wrong or the sports books are wrong for Oklahoma, but it's tough to bet against them just because they somehow know. I think what also plays here in Oklahoma's advantage is you've got 8 out of your 12 games are at home. You know, that's in last year they were undefeated at home. I'm not saying that's going to happen again. Uh, you know that or seven because the Texas game, I guess it's counted as a home game, but it's we, we know it's really not. But so seven of your twelve are, are you know true home games. I, I think I think that 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 helps too. Obviously, I'm biased, but but here's the deal. I really think what what Vegas looks at it is looking at this. They're looking at the wins for OU. I think it's Temple, Houston, Tulane. They're they're like they're going to win those three. I think. Vegas looks at Tennessee and Auburn, they'll they'll split it. They'll win one of those. They'll beat South Carolina and they'll beat Maine. And there's your six wins. And because there is a world, and I hate to sound like this, that Oklahoma could lose the last four out of five games. That is the toughest stretch of the season, starting at that Ole Miss game. Yeah, I mean, there, there is a world. It's not ridiculous to say because they're at Ole Miss, at Missouri, home against Alabama and at LSU, three out of the four SEC games are on the road. And you're starting a basically a freshman quarterback. I mean, when you – I can see why why the line is set at six and a half. And to be completely honest with you, I would probably take under seven and a half if I were actually having to put money on it. So you think we'll be bad too? I think we'll be seven and five, most likely. I mean, I don't know much about LSU, but who are they playing a quarterback next year? They, they just lost the best player in college football, Walker Howard. He played at Texas A and M, right? He was definitely there. I don't know if he played much, but I'm pretty sure that is currently their backup. This is going to be their starter. It's either what? Maybe walk? No, Walker Howard's not there. He's at Ole Miss. Yeah, he transferred to Ole Miss after his freshman year. They brought in someone though, but I mean, yeah, you you've got question marks everywhere. But I, again, it's Garrett, I guess I'd have to look at somewhere else. Their guy, who? Garrett Nussmeyer. Oh, yeah, that that name sounds familiar. Did he transfer in from somewhere? Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's there's question marks at LSU for. I mean, yeah, that, I mean. I understand, but the thing is that home field can probably account for – it's probably going to be a night game. That home field could probably account for a three-point difference. At least. And you've got a quarterback in Jackson Arnold that maybe by the end of the season he's got all the – you know, he's he's humming. He's got, I think he's got a better receiving core than Dylan Gabriel had. I mean, with the exception of Stoops, obviously. That, that is a tough loss, but 
you know, you got Antrell coming back. Hopefully he's healthy all season. You pick up a huge guy in Deion Burks out of the portal. Uh, you know, Jaden Gibson's still there. Jalil Farouk's still there. I, I think the receiving core and the talent around him is better than what Dylan Gabriel had. Yeah, but there's a ton of question marks. I know Oklahoma's brought in a ton of players through the transfer portal along the offensive line. The offensive line is the, the giant question mark. They have the talent, but can they put it all together? And I think when you look at a whole new starting offensive line, a new quarterback, it's a huge part of your offense. I mean, I mean, yeah, you've got the receivers and you've got the running back, but if you you don't have the offensive line and the quarterbacks could be shaky at times. I mean, I remember watching Spencer Rattler his first year starting, and I know Rattler, I'm not saying he was better than Jackson Arnold, but there were a lot of ups and downs with Spencer Rattler. I mean, the, the highs were high and the lows were low. I mean, some of the interceptions were were rough. But I'm not saying that, you know, Jackson Arnold is not better than him because I think Jackson Arnold is. But it just comes with playing and the yeah. growth. And so if I were having to put money on it, I would, I would take the under seven and a half because at the end of the day, Vegas knows and there's a reason why they're in business. And they never close their doors. Um, but they're not always right. I'm not saying that Oklahoma couldn't. But if I were having to put 100, 100 bucks, 1000 bucks, I'm taking the under 7.5. Now, if it's at, if the line was actually at 6.5 still, I would take the over there. Because I think Oklahoma could win a seventh game for sure. Well, I think obviously we all want them to go 12-0 and every single season. Uh, mm-hmm. and that's, that's not realistic. But if you wanted to make a little friendly wager here on, on the program, just me and you, I uh, I will take the over seven and a half. Uh, and obviously we all want them to win a, a, a trillion games, but if we do have a down season, you can at least win something. But it feels terrible to win something. If we have a down year, see, I, I would never actually like walk into a sports book and take the under on OU's win total. I don't think I'd ever do that. Yeah. I couldn't do it either. Yeah. I, I just, now Oklahoma state, I could walk in there and take the under. No God, problem. Hammers. <laughs> but I don't think I could ever really do it because then I would catch myself like, oh, man, I, I wouldn't be upset if they lost. And that's just so convoluted. That's that's wrong. No, you would still be upset if you lost. Yeah. I, don't know. I, I, I think hammer the over at seven and a half. I don't know. I, I think it's an eight win team at, at worst case. We'll really see how much the internet the belief you have in Jackson Arnold. The internet lives forever, so you know if I'm wrong, it'll it'll be here, for, you know. But I, I think, I think it's an eight-win team at worst. We'll see. We've got the countdown on. Well, I said eight. Over. Brown seven and five. Hose, what's your record record prediction? I'm gonna stick with the nine and three that I said. Okay, I like right it. When we ended the yeah. season. Yeah, I know. I initially said nine and three, but I'm I'm backing myself. Down from waffling. I am. All right. I I get it. Vegas knows something that we don't. It happens every time. Freaking yesterday, Mm -hmm. I had Trey Young to hit over 34 and a half points and assist, but he got 33. Missed a million shots, but how do you get that Uh, close? I had uh, Paul George at 27 and a half. He had 27. So, yeah, I feel you. Or like the in the Super Bowl where the. The win to, or the total points opened up at 46 and a half, then it closed at like 47 and a half. And just, yep. I mean, yeah. They got that wild. thing figured out. That's why they're in business. They never close, they they always make money. So, it's true. I mean, they were always losing money. I don't think they'd be in business. So, but that's all I've got. Do um, you guys have any final thoughts? If not, Brandon, go for it. Yeah, so we'll do a two-parter. Obviously, we talked about win totals, uh, what, what we think. Brum's at seven. I'm at eight. Eight at worst. I was at nine. So obviously, drop you know your thoughts there because that should be like like you, like you mentioned at the top. Brum, a fun a fun discussion in the comment section. Hopefully, uh, get opinions from all over the place. Uh, and the second one, I had to miss last week's episode, but last last Tuesday when y'all recorded Wednesday when when the when the people saw it, but. Last Tuesday, we lost Oklahoma legend Toby Keith. You know, he's obviously a huge Sooner. He's a big just Oklahoma guy in general, just the state. So we'll do your favorite Toby Keith song. All right. Well, sounds good. Um, 
Toby Keith has, has a lot of great songs. A lot of great songs. Great guy, man. Yeah, it's a shame. So, and as we're finishing this recording, the OU basketball game does not look pretty. Doesn't look great. So, all right, if you made it this far, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, turn the notification bell on. That made Hose very happy that OU basketball is struggling. Uh, be sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Apple, Spotify, and TikTok. Everything's linked in the description below, and we'll catch you guys next time.